What is the rural digital divide? What are the connectivity issues impacting students living in rural areas as they attempt to learn at a distance during this time of pandemic? And what are the public and non-public options for overcoming that divide to ensure all students equitable access to reliable high-speed internet access? Those are the questions we'll work to answer and the issues we'll work to unpack with 2020 Jefferson Educational Society Civic Leadership Academy alumnus and Ramey Fellow Jeff Staborski, a tech industry professional and himself a graduate of an Erie Region Rural School District. Uh, we're going to address this timely and crucial issue impacting Erie County students and their families. Jeff Jeff is going to share insights gleaned from his study of access to high-speed internet access in the Wattsburg Area School District and outline possible next steps for overcoming the rural digital divide as we explore his research topic titled Overcoming the Rural Digital Divide. Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spag and I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a Contributing Editor at the Area Reader. Now, alongside me for this program is my colleague, JES scholar and residence, Dr. Andrew Roth. Uh, in addition to producing his prolific book notes series, offering numerous presentations, including his American Tapestry Project and American Holidays series, uh, and hosting a radio show available locally on WQLN Public Media and nationally on the NPR One app, Dr. Roth facilitates the Ramey Fellowship Program. Before I turn it over to him to say a bit more about the Ramey Fellowship Program and to introduce our presenter here, Folks, a few programmatic notes. Uh, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section below. If you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, still send us your questions or comments. Keep this conversation going and remain engaged. And of course, for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, visit our website, jeserie.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrew Roth back to the JES Digital Stage this time to introduce our presenter and tell us more about the Ramey Fellowship Program where he facilitates that. Welcome, Dr. Roth. Welcome, Ben, and welcome, Jeff. I'm looking forward to your presentation this afternoon. Uh, as Ben said, uh, amongst other things I do at the Jefferson, I facilitate uh, the Ramey Fellowship Program. And for those who uh, perhaps are looking in for the first time, a little bit of background on the Ramey Fellowship Program. It's an outgrowth of the Jefferson uh, Society's Civic Leadership Academy. Uh, the Civic Leadership Academy, I believe, began as long ago as 2012 or 2013, if, I, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, and the first couple of years, we did not have a Ramey Fellows Program, but alumni of those programs uh, asked if they might have, or if it would be possible to produce or, or create a program that would have a little bit of uh, the flavor of a graduate seminar in leadership for no lack of a better word, theory, or just uh, thinking about leadership. Uh, the Civic Leadership Academy itself is a wonderful program, but it's very much uh, action-oriented, street-level, practical politics, meeting with people who are, in fact, uh, our local community and countywide, and actually state uh, uh, political leaders, and also those uh, individuals in private industry and in the not-for-profit social services sector. Uh, and as a result, it didn't really talk a lot about, uh, it didn't distill leadership theory. And so we came up with this idea of the Ramey Fellows, and the Ramey Fellows program basically consists of two parts. Uh, one of which you are going to get a first-hand, first-class, first-hand experience here in about five minutes when Ben and I get off stage and turn it over to Jeff. Uh, it consists of two parts, an individual research project by a fellow, and as I said earlier, a mini, um, and I emphasize mini, uh, seminar on some leadership theory. The program, I believe now, uh, is in its third or fourth year, the pandemic uh, has thrown me off a little in my calculations, but previous Ramey fellows and people who have uh, successfully completed the program uh, have done all kinds of very interesting research projects. Uh, just a month or two ago, uh, Ben and I uh, shared with you a presentation by Brian Zona and Joe Cunio on caring for those who care for us in terms of they were looking at uh, compensation and uh, employment issues for those frontline people engaged in human services, particularly working with uh, the developmentally disadvantaged. 
uh, earlier, uh, I think our very first Facebook live stream we may have done sometime in last November or December was on a topic related to today's topic, Matt Weirdel, uh, a Ramey fellow in the class of 2019, uh, did a program on the urban digital divide. And then uh, earlier, people produced essays and, and these programs, these live streams will ultimately be transformed into uh, short essays. Uh, earlier uh, essayists were, uh, and I think I'll mention their names, Seth Trott, who is now a law student at Dickinson School of Law. Seth did a wonderful project uh, on creating a, minor a minority business incubator in Erie. And although that exact concept uh, isn't what's happening. There is a, 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 a program being developed in Erie uh, similar to it that at least got its inspiration from Seth and Michael Outlaw's work. Uh, Yamura Shakur Hooker uh, did, a, did research on food deserts in Erie and came up with a really uh, creative idea, uh, not of farmer's markets, but uh, because a farmer's market's a tough sell in Erie in February, uh, but she came up with the notion borrowing an idea that I think she found in Toronto, Canada, uh, with food trucks. Well, you'd have mobile farmer, farmer's markets and versions of food trucks. And April Soriano uh, early on did uh, an analysis of the needs of rural poor uh, and came up with a program that would create a network of volunteers who would be willing to uh, offer their services. And so, that's the Ramey Fellows Program. Uh, the, the fellows engage in a piece of uh, independent research uh, looking into an, an issue of contemporary importance in the greater Erie area, not just Erie City, but Erie County. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as I think about it, three or four of the, two or three of the four or five projects, that, five or six projects that have come to the conclusion have been about the county and not the city, which is a good thing. And today we will be hearing about another issue that is uh, outside the city, that it's important. As I said, Matt Weirdel uh, last, November, last November did one on the urban digital divide. Today, Jeff Staborski, who is a Ramey fellow and has been said, uh, Jay's, the leadership, Civic Leadership Academy class of 2020 and a Ramey fellow uh, 2021. Jeff is actually a, a, a native Erie Countyan. He is himself a graduate of a rural high school, Union City High School, if memory serves me correct. And Jeff also attended and graduated from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and the Pennsylvania State University. Jeff is going to look at the rural digital divide uh, and its impact on uh, educational opportunities uh, for students uh, living in the county. And so Jeff, uh, I don't know, Ben, if I want to go back to you or we'll just directly ask Jeff how he got interested in that and what, what drew his attention to that topic. Sure, so I, I can answer that. Um, as, as part of the Civic Leadership Academy, we were introduced to the idea of, of uh, the Ramey Fellowship. And I thought, well, I'm only gonna ever do this once. So if I'm gonna do it, um, I might as well take full advantage of what's in front of me. Uh, and, and so I spitballed the idea of going back and forth. Again, I, I come from a rural area. I currently live in a very rural area. And uh, just within the last, I think, year and a half, so we just beat the pandemic by a few months, uh, we were afforded a high-speed broadband internet access. Uh, both my wife and I are professionals. It changed the way that we remote and connect both uh, for, for you know, daily living and, uh, and for, for remote work as well. Uh, that proved to be invaluable as uh, the pandemic did send us both home for full-time remote work, of which we're both participating in, in today. Um, and that experience, <clears throat> both for the good and for the, the negatives that came with it, um, was very highly impactful in our lives. Uh, for example, it's something that you don't really consider, but I did port some Wi-Fi out to my barn uh, because when you know, you're looking up a, a part to try to fix a tractor, it's really nice to have that in real time versus walking back and forth to the house. Uh, so you know, it's, uh, it, was, it was kind of strange how that, that came there. Um, and I did want to make this very prescriptive. As Dr. Roth mentioned, uh, this, was, uh, this was around civic leadership. And so just uh, going out and reporting, hey, you know, rural areas need some help. That's not very prescriptive. So my, my target or my intention was to engage, uh, you, you know, a municipality or a, a school district, something that would have uh, a heavy, uh, a heavy uh, presence in the community uh, to take a look at 
current options, uh, what, what they're doing, and maybe look at how they can start to, uh, to expand that and, and overcome that. Uh, since then, the pandemic has let us down some, uh, some very interesting roads uh, politically. And uh, you know, now we've seen um, both the, the last two administrations start to allocate and recognize broadband infrastructure as true uh, service infrastructure. Um, you know, it, tying that broadband access almost as important as power and water and, and sewage were available. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, that that is really lending on, again, the remote work experience, the remote online learning experience, um, and, and certainly just impact on daily lives that the pandemic has had. Um, I address within within the paper, uh, you know, that that's when when folks were sent home, uh, you know, that put uh, employees and students under the same roof uh, for the first time utilizing the same connections that had been present, you know, throughout all of this time. And it was a very different experience for everyone. Um, again, some positive, some negative, some maybe didn't even notice. So I think exploring that idea to see uh, what the impact truly was. Uh, was and then offering up again some prescriptive services for for uh, in this case Wattsburg area school district. Uh, I thought would would have some uh, possible tangible impact and hopefully improve the lives for not only the folks out here in the east part of the county, but uh, I, I did make this generic enough that this could be handed out to any municipality, any school district, and some of these things could be followed as well. So if you're wondering why I don't name names or uh, or or talk about very specific. Services, service providers to contact. That's because, the, you know, identifying public politicians is generally pretty accessible, as well as identifying available service providers, um, you know, for municipalities is generally pretty accessible as well. We'll get into that near the end of the presentation, but that's kind of a little bit of background about how I got to where I got and, uh, and, and why I chose the topics I did. Okay, well, that's really excellent. And it uh, just for our audiences to draw their attention to this is not an abstract thing. This is not uh, something that, well, oh, this is interesting. This is something that directly impacted Jeff in, in his life, uh, as he pointed out. And real quickly, uh, I know Jeff is going to get into this, and I'll let him and Ben set up the screen sharing here. But real quickly, uh, for those listening, and I suspect if you've tuned in today, uh, or even if you click on this later, uh, in, the, in the next couple of days or the next week or two, you probably know what rural digital divide means, but real quickly, digital divide talks about the differences between a community, whether it's in the city of Erie or it's in the county, but it, between a community that has uh, uh, cheap, easily accessed, affordable, uh, broad, high-speed broadband uh, internet connections and those who don't. And one of the things that uh, in the earlier presentation that Matt Weirdle did, and I've learned a lot from, about this from uh, both Matt and Jeff, uh, is that, uh, and I think Jeff just touched on it, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, that as we move forward, this is actually kind of a bipartisan thing. High-speed broadband internet access is now uh, almost approaching, I think it's actually approached, the, it's the equivalent of a public utility, whether it be gas, sewer, electricity, water, Etc. Uh, it's just, uh, and, and what we're going to be living through in the next several years in the United States, I think, is going to be something similar to the Rural Electrification Act of the 1930s. This is just, this is not really something to debate about. And I think it does have, uh, at least conceptually and in general, bipartisan support. They may argue about the mechanics of how they go about it. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ben and Jeff, who will set up screen sharing, and I'm going to mute myself temporarily so I can listen to Jeff. All right. Uh, if I could just get a confirmation um, from Ben and Dr. Roth that we have a, a screen share up, that's fantastic. Uh, although, I, there we go. I uh, still have a screen share up. Awesome. Great. Um, so thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Uh, it, it is my pleasure to be uh, participating in this today. Um, this was a, a, a little bit of work, so all, um, all thanks to Dr. Roth for, for bringing me along in this journey uh, from an academic standpoint, for Ben for uh, taking his time out to, uh, to prepare and let me present, uh, to my wife who is, has proofread multiple times um, versions of my paper and, and kind of helped me focus in and center uh, with two young children. I, I can assure you her help has been paramount uh, along the way as well, so a special thanks to her. Um, so overcoming the rural digital divide. What exactly does that mean and what are we going to talk about? So very briefly, we'll, we'll cover what is the digital divide. 
Um, we'll talk about Wattsburg Area School District, uh, who was the, the target of my research. Um, full disclosure, I am, a, I am a resident of Green Township. So uh, both of my kids will be attending Wattsburg Area School District. Uh, I, as Dr. Roth mentioned, I, I'm from the Union City area, um, out towards the Quarry Way actually. And so uh, lived out in a very rural part of the county then as well. Um, what can I say? I like trees, you know, right here and here I am. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, rural access methods. So what, uh, you know, folks who are kind of out of the city or out of a, uh, a, a true borough um, or, or a, a, a much more um, socially packed municipality, um, you know, what, what we've traditionally done to, to get online. Uh, the survey that, that went out, uh, this was all qualitative data gathered from uh, actual households attending the Wattsburg Area School District, what some of those results look like, and, uh, and some possibly prescriptive steps for both the Wattsburg Area School District and other, uh, other interested parties. So, you know, as Dr. Roth touched upon, what is the rural or the digital divide? And it's not just uh, set to, to rural areas. <clears throat> the digital divide is, uh, you know, uh, some sort of divide between communities or, or really um, online communities that are able to have affordable, high-speed internet access and all of the benefits um, and occasional drawbacks, but mostly benefits that come with that, right? So we're talking about folks who have um, can 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 find research topics, as I kind of alluded to in our introduction. You know, can can go out and and look at parts diagrams to help them with things around the house, to be able to contact and and find services, and you know, really replace the phone book as it exists. Um, you know, that isn't always prevalent, and and we we started to take that for granted. Um, but and that's not even the the leisure part of the digital divide. You know, online streaming services and online gaming and all the things that that folks can enjoy um, at their at their leisure. So I really focused on, you know, what was available to households? Um, was it affordable to households? Could did the did the options available? Were they understandable? And subsequently, when a service was brought into the home, was it usable? And, and there's a, a key phrase that came, kept com, coming up in my research, and that's uh, this, the uh, subject of digital literacy. And digital literacy um, is just how does one consume and properly understand the services that are available. I think some examples here are if you've always had, say, satellite internet service. Um, you know, like for example, I think the most common one on the market is is HughesNet, and uh, and you just aren't sure what else is out there, so you stay rooted to that carrier. Maybe you're having a good experience there, maybe you're not. Um, you're not willing to look for additional options. Additionally, once that service enters the home, is it being broadcast via wireless, or do you have to sit in one spot in the home? Um, you know, if you have cellular coverage, do, do you have a hotspot or a cellular modem that needs to get moved? from room to room as you want to use it, or are you able to distribute that equitably throughout the house so that the services you wish to consume are available where it's most conducive to consume them? Think of a uh, student studying in the office or in the den uh, on a computer and, and having to uh, have constant disruptions whenever anyone turns the microwave on in the kitchen. You know, that's a real thing that you can face within, within a household. Um, so, you know, some, some other facts around the digital divide that were very interesting and were, were, were very pressing around and in the pandemic, um, you know, when I started looking into this, you know, there were a number of statistics, and these were pre-pandemic statistics, right? About seven in 10 teachers are assigning uh, homework that it requires some sort of online access. Um, whether you want to take a trip to the library, and remember, we're talking about rural households, so it's not exactly around the corner, um, you know, are, are putting these projects and these assignments out, as well as the collaborative efforts that students can take um, in the K through 12 or, or college environments um, where, where they're, they're collaborating on group projects, group papers, group sources. Um, statistically, anywhere between 10 to 15% of all households nationwide are without high speed internet access, as we'll delve a little bit more into Pennsylvania specifics. Um, those who are uh, or who have access to high speed access isn't always what it's cracked up to be. And there are some, um, and almost equate them to blue laws on the books uh, where some very prudent lobbying dollars were spent to keep those data, uh, to keep that data and those statistics skewed um, probably in the wrong way for the digital di divide. And, and, and traditionally this, this whole concept of K through 12 students 
and their access to source materials or collaboration materials, or even the online content they need is commonly referred to as the homework gap. Um, so if you're ever interested in doing more of these things, you can find these terms out um, all over the internet and uh, fascinating stuff from what you'll see. So again, I did choose Wattsburg Area School District just because I am a, a, a uh, my students do go to school there. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, it's a small, small school district in, in rural Eastern Erie County. Uh, we had 1,200 students enrolled for the 2021 um, school year. Uh, about 110 students chose to do uh, use the Wattsburg cyber program. And then there, I think there are approximately another 100 students enrolled in PA cyber programs. Um, throughout the district. So, you know, Wattsburg, when we talk about how rural is it from a, from a geographic standpoint, you know, it's, it's, uh, it ranks 92nd in total square miles out of 501 school districts in, in terms of size and 98th in population density. So it's certainly in the top 20% when we consider rural schools in, in the state of Pennsylvania, but by no means the most rural school. And I think that that's where, you know, coming across some of these stats that I'll be sharing with you um, were really kind of um, enlightening and eye-opening. And the other interesting thing about Wattsburg uh, School District is made up of five municipalities. Um, Amity, uh, Green, Greenfield, and Venango Townships, and then the Wattsburg Borough. Um, traditionally, and just for some context, as there will be a slide, um, it, actually there isn't a slide now that I say that, um, Green Township and Wattsburg Borough both have um, traditional, what we would consider high-speed broadband cable or fiber access. And the other three districts or the other three municipalities, if they have access to something like that, are just because those uh, there is a tangential route taken through that municipality. Um, so uh, the provider for both Wattsburg and Green is Armstrong Cable, um, centered out of Butler, Pennsylvania. So traditional rural access methods, when we start talking about how do folks who are out in the country get on and, and what does that access look like? Uh, the current FCC definition uh, for, for broadband access is 25 megs down and three megs up. The Pennsylvania definition is 1.54 megs down and 128 uh, kilobytes per second up. So why is that? Uh, well, so Pennsylvania um, and some very astute lobbying dollars um, were, were, was able to keep the legislature as part of the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Utilities Act to keep a lower definition for broadband just because it was a little faster than um, than, than traditional dial-up methods. Um, in fact, this, this definition pretty much fits the definition for DSL service throughout the state. Now, I'm sure you can imagine there is one very, um, very prevalent provider in the state of Pennsylvania. It rhymes with Verizon, and uh, they are the ones who, uh, who really wanted this DSL uh, aspect to stay in for, for what a broadband access method or, or what that speed would look like. Um, and of course, when we declare that, that speed, you know, some folks could argue that, well, actually I get more out of my DSL and, or I may get less or it's so unreliable, it doesn't even matter. And that's because uh, this is using, this is internet communications over traditional phone lines. So the age of the equipment, the distance from the substations, uh, all of that can play into effect with the quality of the service uh, coming from that. So when we talk about download and upload speed, you know, this is this has been very important as far as, far as the pandemic goes, because um, when we talk about download speed, think of accessing content, right? I'm streaming a show, I'm trying to download a, a paper or a PDF file. And when we talk about upload speed, we're doing the exact opposite. We're, we're putting things back. We're, we're sending things up, up to the cloud, you know, whatever that means, right? Um, but when we talk about something like today's format, where we have three three panelists and we're interacting and it's, it's very bi-directional in its communication, that's more like what traditional classroom education has looked like for years. Um, there are some, you know, new educational techniques out there, flipped classrooms and whatnot. But for the most part, when students were sent home for, uh, for COVID-19, um, you know, uh, precautionary uh, uh, restrictions, you know, we basically saw that, that teachers adapted their same type of in-classroom personas across with students. So all of a sudden, that, that huge skew in the download versus upload speed uh, can make a very big difference in the quality of that classroom experience as, as is currently kind of practiced by the majority of our, our, of our public education professionals. Um, 
Also, just one other note as we're talking about some of these numbers, the 25-3 is very important because the traditional high orbit satellite provider, HughesNet, was able to, uh, through some capacity and technology increases in their at-home equipment distribution, they are able to achieve at peak times, 25 megs down and three megs up. So there will be some, some data that I will point out as we move along here that satellite traditional high speed, or sorry, high orbit satellite like HughesNet can meet these speed thresholds. Uh, however, that is in optimal conditions. And we'll talk more about that later. So again, we mentioned the COVID-19, what remote learning looked like. And when we talk about speed, uh, speed is one thing, but the reliability is another. Uh, cellular hotspots tend to struggle in that you can get uh, plenty of speed out of them if you do have cell service where you happen to live or where you happen to try to learn. Uh, however, you know, weather conditions, um, even flora and fauna, uh, high, um, high pollen counts, uh, bird migrations, like, you know, all of these things that affect direct line of sight uh, can absolutely influence what these, uh, what that service uh, footprint uh, and quality looks like. And, and, you know, when we talk about download only, you know, we, we there are a bunch of um, built-in checks in the protocol stack um, real nerdy here, right? Uh, where we talk about buffering and we can talk and error checking and what latency looks like. And latency is simply how long it takes for your request to, to meet up to its source and then come back to you. And, and we see that in traditional rural access methods, um, the latency is incredibly high. So regardless of the speed you're achieving, that high latency is going to impact what your overall experience is going to look like. Um, so, you know, the most traditional rural, rural access method that we ever had was dial up, think back to AOL, think back to all of those early, you know, 33.6 uh, and 50 or 56K modems. You know, then we started seeing DSL come around um, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the mid 90s. And of course, DSL was remarkably faster. And the original FCC uh, definition for broadband did center around DSL. That's how Pennsylvania uh, got locked into its uh, current definition of, of broadband as well. And then we saw satellite providers come along. And, you know, satellite providers, especially like a, a high orbit provider, and, and there's a reason I'm differentiating high and low, and we'll get to that in just a, just a few here. You know, high orbit satellite is that it's incredibly high latency. You're talking about uh, data transmission that has to get beamed up through the stratosphere and then come right back down. And that takes time. Um, so those were those are traditionally what we think about when we talk about um, rural access methods. Uh, an emerging method has been as cellular service has expanded and we've gone to 4G or LTE and now 5G service, that cellular hotspots have started to gain popularity. Um, you know, Wattsburg School District used some CARES Act money and made cellular hotspots available for any students without internet access. And they definitely serve a niche. They're very easy to install. They're very portable. Um, but, you know, the experience, the reliability within that data set, not, uh, not really comparable to what a true broadband connection looks like. Of course, then we have what we would consider, you know, look at, you know, traditional or, um, or, or what we want for high speed broadband. So that's a, a cable, cable modems, fiber, uh, you know, the fiber optic connection with a, with a modem on the back end. And, you know, those, those are starting to achieve speeds now that are, are actually um, controlled by and clipped by the provider. So you, there are service speed increases uh, in most areas, you know, but it's all correlated to money. And the, the easiest way I could, can describe this is downloads are relatively cheap. Uh, upload speed is where you're going to start to pay pay your most money. So when you start to look at introductory packages from uh, traditional cable providers, you know you're looking at you know 25 megs down, five megs up, and then your next package is 50 megs down and 10 megs up, and your next you know your gaming package 100 megs down and 50 megs up. And the reason why those those uh, that that download number is always higher is because download is easy. Upload is where you have to have to invest uh, quite a bit of the infrastructure and the equipment. So uh, you know broadband uh, as it as it stands today does serve that need. And then there's kind of a new rural access method that's just coming along. It's technically officially in beta testing, and that's low orbit satellite. Um, the most common brand that we can think of right now is the Starlink service. Um, that's that's kind of a Elon Musk's um, uh, introductory service to the market. And there are quite a few, um, you know, based on 
what his expected consumer profile is going to look like, there is some real possibilities that in the most remote locations, um, this may be a problem solver. The download and upload speed is, is uh, sufficient for most online learning methods. Uh, the latency is very low because the satellites, again, are low orbit satellites. Um, there's plenty of debate on what the night sky will look like and if we'll be all very uh, happy to see a bunch of satellites circling the globe uh, at, at low orbit. But that's a discussion for another time, uh, not what I want to delve into here with, with, these, with these methods. But that is an emerging uh, rural access method that may, may prove dividends uh, as we move along. So when we start talking about broadband infrastructure, I think the number that jumped out at me uh, from a 2017 Department of Transportation study was it's about $27,000 a mile to run true fiber optic broadband service. So as we start to think about Wattsburg Area School District and the 140 square miles it covers, that number adds up quickly. When we start extrapolating the number of households um, you know, in Wattsburg Area School District per square mile, um, you know, you're, we're still somewhere around $3,500 to $4,000 per household per provider. So the return on investment isn't great uh, for just a provider to take the initiative to just go start running lines, right? But that's where a lot of the infrastructure dollars that are being provided at the federal and even state levels, uh, and even in some cases, you can pull some of that, that monies from the county, and we'll talk about that too as we get to our, uh, my kind of prescriptive methods here. Um, you know, it's, it, it's expensive, but it's, but it's doable, and there is money out there to start looking for these types of things. So, what did I do to, to try to gain a true understanding of, of the Wasburg Area School District and how much of a digital divide it really faces? Um, you know, so the, the, I administered this survey in, in January of this year. Uh, so the students were already in, in back to school learning at that time. Uh, Wattsburg uh, entered a very careful plan with, with you know, I give their administration and their, and their, uh, and their board lots of credit. Um, both my wife and I felt very comfortable in sending our, our student back, um, you know, early in the fall. And, and I think Wattsburg has managed that very well. Just my opinion. There is no qualitative data to support that. I'm all in. Anywho, uh, so, you know, very happy with the way the district handled this. And the district was actually very supportive of this survey. I went to the, the, uh, the administration who subsequently went to the board. I presented this idea to the board and they were very happy as well to kind of get an idea of what this really looks like within their district. So, the survey was uh, administered out to every uh, email address that exists in the Wattsburg uh, uh, student uh, information system. Uh, so it went out to all households that, has a, that have a valid email address. Uh, we did get a 38% response rate, which I think is very good. So about four out of 10 people took the time to answer this. As we'll start to notice when we get into some of the data behind um, you know, what the 40% uh, of folks who did respond uh, look like, I think that I think there's actually some very interesting parts of that number, and that kind of even goes back to some of the digital literacy we talked about uh, early in the presentation. So we really I focused the survey on um, on the online experience for households during online learning. So what were some of the examples of questions that were asked to, to focus on the online experience? And that was, you know, do you have to help your students reconnect? If, uh, if a parent is working from home or a guardian is working from home at the same time, does the student need more help reconnecting? Uh, do you find that there are good times versus bad times, you know, during the day? Um, you know, what weather dependence um, during the day, at night, in the evening, you know, that your students can, um, can, can learn. Do you have to postpone online learning because there just isn't enough bandwidth or reliability to conduct the session uh, at the time the student would have wanted to? So those were type, some of the types of questions we, we, I tried to use to derive the experience. Um, there, were, there was no personally identifiable uh, information um, within collected by the, the, the survey, no home addresses, no, no names, you know, social security numbers. Uh, this was to be completely anonymous, again, focusing on service. And there was no academic correlation measured. And there's, there's a, a few reasons behind this. Um, 
Um, for one thing, you know, whether a student's academic performance increased during the pandemic and then, um, you know, stayed increased after, uh, whether it worsened, whether the grades, uh, the grading curve in general got easier, those are all things that would be very difficult to measure, uh, difficult or district by district, let alone for, for me uh, outside with no real authority uh, or, um, uh, or, or right to this student data. Um, I just didn't want to blur any academics with it. Um, through tangential shreds of evidence, I've heard that, you know, some of the grading curves in other districts have actually been higher during the pandemic because, you know, as a, again, going back to the online education experience, if I'm a teacher and I'm conducting in a classroom style that I'm used to, you know, my participation, my uh, in-class assignments, all of those things much harder to judge and much harder to gauge, um, which really makes the reliance on that bi-directional communication and high upload, high download, high reliable uh, communication um, that it really centers in on, on, uh, on that experience. And again, I did mention the district offered hotspots as part of the CARES Act. So, um, you know, I, I think I've already covered most of this slide. Uh, you know, we, we were able to, or I was able to ascertain a lot of this information from these questions. Um, you know, the digital literacy is very hard to gauge. There were a few questions scattered throughout the survey that gave me uh, some, some hints toward that, that digital literacy, but nothing I could come back and, and absolutely, you know, show with a qualitative, this is the number and this is why. And then, you know, tried to compare to national trends, especially around the digital literacy and the speed and reliability metrics uh, as much as possible. You know, how, how differentiated was Wattsburg from the rest of, of, of the country um, as it related to a, a, lot of these, a lot of these facts. So survey results, you know, what did we find out? You know, 85 of the 417 respondents did not have any sort of internet uh, access at home when the pandemic started. So that number jumps out right away. Now, now is that a digital literacy thing? Um, I, I would argue if 85 households didn't feel that internet was um, was attainable for them at home um, with students in a school district. Um, that may hint to that uh, that that online literacy isn't necessarily. Um, something we could point to as, as a strength of the household. Again, very tangential. Um, you know, those folks could be IT professionals working for, for Google for all I know, but they did not have internet at home. Um, and then, you know, what does that look like today? Um, you know, 330 households now have some sort of commodity internet service. Uh, 129 of the 417 respondents um, utilize the hotspots as provided by the district. And still 14 households in the district, no internet access as of today. Um, I can only assume, and again, the, no, no data to support this, I can only assume that there is no cellular cover, coverage where they live. And so taking a school provided hotspot would have meant absolutely nothing for those nothing for them. So I thought those numbers were very interesting, uh, both from, uh, well, this is kind of what the district looked like as kind of a, a microcosm, um, you know, from the very, from the very uh, get go. Um, so, you know, what type of, uh, of privately uh, purchased internet do you have now? So about half of, of, of Wattsburg uh, uh, respondents of the survey, um, you know, are, do have some sort of broadband internet access. 41% do not. If we take satellite data out of that, uh, that drops to an even 50-50. So in other words, the, the Wattsburg Area School District and the geographic footprint of the households within that district, 50% of school district, uh, of, of, the, of those households do not have access to any sort of high-speed broadband. Um, which I think is, you know, really does point to that digital divide. Um, so, you know, when we start to break, uh, break that data apart and, you know, how reliable are the individual services themselves? You know, this was one of the questions that was asked is, you know, is the connection always reliable? And we see that, you know, by far broadband by percentage, um, you know, that's, 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 that's the cable fiber broadband, um, you know, easily the, the most desirable metric from a, from a, a reliable reliability standpoint, you know, you can see DSL, um, dial up satellite, um, even, even hotspots. Um, and in this case, it's, uh, these were just measured against private hotspots. You know, we can see that there's a lot of reliability issues there. You know, some of the things that really jumped out, you know, even the fiber connections here, um, you know, 70% report of households reported more than three significant outages a month. Uh, that's higher than national averages for, for homes consuming a broadband service. Um, and I think may point to something going on um, after the modem, which is something maybe related to more inside the household than necessarily 
um, you know, from, from the last mile, uh, you know, back to the service provider. So uh, just just that was an interesting data point that stuck out. Um, you know, again, we were looking at when, when someone's using satellite service, 77% of households using the satellite service had to delay schoolwork to some other time. If we look at cellular and DSL data, uh, also in the mid 70s around delaying schoolwork, that's not a great environment for kids to learn. Um, you know, that means at some point somebody tried, they got them down in front of a computer. You know, we're talking ages K through 12. So whether that's uh, getting a, a, you know, speaking as a father of a kindergartner, man, getting them to focus at all is amazing, let alone, you know, having to maybe delay some sort of online learning to, to a, another time you can get them to focus. And again, as, as you could expect, the reliability and outage metrics. Um, you know, uh, within within that those footprints uh, much worse than what we were seeing with broadband. Um, looking around, uh, do do parents have to help their uh, their students reconnect if they're sharing some sort of commodity service? Um, you know, twenty six percent had uh, broadband uh, broadband customers had to help their students reconnect, where it was sixty eight or, or roughly seventy percent of non-broadband households. So again, we see a huge gap with data in the 25, in the 20%, 20th percentile to the, to the mid 70th percentile of inconveniences uh, within the home. So that's parents and, and you know, possibly coming away from remote work themselves, uh, you know, working to get their students reconnected. Um, and again, there's that 50% number of, of students who don't actually have access to broadband. Uh, so, you know, multiple households within the district have multiple students at home. Um, and, uh, and again, if, if uh, those numbers are very similar um, to, uh, to what we saw from the, uh, from the connection metrics as well, that they have to, uh, have to help students uh, reconnect if they share a service with broadband, clearly the, uh, the outstanding leader in, in that regard compared to, uh, compared to everything else. Uh, you know, then asking uh, within that same survey, you know, what are your, what are your biggest obstacles um, to, uh, to to this to this this experience and uh you know tech support hit the list um, affordability certainly hit the list and lack of desired service options hit the list you know 118 households out of 417 said we face no obstacles it, or, uh, around 30 percent so you know 30 percent of our of, of the students in this district at least that you know that answered the survey um you know don't face any of these obstacles um uh, to to their to their online experience and i think that's the that's the striking number right um whether it's a funding source whether it's a uh it's a service availability source, whether it's improving the reliability of the existing services or, or helping households, you know, with their, with their technology inside the home, uh, that, that number really jumped out as, as you know, um, a, a, key, a key, key number there. Uh, and then some other aspects of that digital literacy. And again, this is all about just very tangential shreds of, of digital literacy uh, within, within the survey respondents. You know, 38% response rate. Um, you know, you would think that uh, if you didn't have uh, online access or you didn't have very reliable or defendable online access at home, it would certainly skew your ability to answer this survey. So I would, I would guess that as part of that response rate, we would find that folks who didn't respond, um, you know, could certainly be related to the same problems that, we, that I've talked about and, and looked at here. Um, we did see, uh, you know, again, tangential, some shreds of data, you know, what incorrect reporting on services that households could actually buy and consume within their service area, um, what those service options looked like, if they could, you know, increase that speed or if, 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 um, if such a thing was even available. Um, you know, again, I did point out that the, the struggles around folks with fiber broadband access were a lot higher than national customer service um, uh, averages uh, from from a, a number of metrics and a number of providers, and you know we did see a very high dependency on school provided hotspots. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I, I believe of the uh, 417 respondents, something like 17 households were utilizing multiple commodity providers. In other words, they had satellite and cellular, or they had um, DSL and cellular. So you know when we talk about affordability. Um, and I can't speak to if the house, you know, if, if you know, they're Scrooge McDuck or if, the, if they're not, but, you know, paying for two services just to give the house a, a fighting chance of getting a uh, reliable broadband or reliable online access, I guess I should say, um, you know, that, that was kind of alarming and kind of telling all in itself. Um, additionally, I think of the, of the households that pulled, um, that had school provided hotspots, I think we, I, I saw something like 50 
uh, uh, 56 or 57 households also had some sort of commodity service. So, you know, that tells me that the commodity services that are available in these households, you know, parents looked at each other and said, hey, if, if you know, Timmy or, or Susie are going to be home and, and doing schoolwork, we can't have them sharing our service. It won't be reliable enough for all of us. Get the hotspot as well. Um, and I, I think that that also speaks to, you know, what some of the challenges the households are facing um, as, it, as it relates to, uh, to this problem. So, don't mean to be negative there, right? This is not a Wattsburg area school district problem. This is a rural school district problem. This is what legacy infrastructure looks like when, when houses grow and people start to you know, you know, move from the city and, and we start to crop up you know, more and more folks coming out to the, to, to the country, so to speak, um, you know, kind of the opposite of what we saw um, when we saw the great urbanization in, in, in the mid fifties. Um, you know, but this is, a, this is a problem for folks and, and for, for rural areas areas that to have. So what can we do? You know, what, what can districts, what can municipalities do to, to solve this problem? Well, for starters, fill out your census form. The federal government allocates about $2,100 per person um, uh, on average from the census. And so filling that form out and giving a true representation of the folks within your municipality, within your county, within your state, absolutely influences how much money gets divvied out later on down the road. Contact your local municipal governments. Have them get plans in place. Um, and by plans, I mean specific. There, if we took broadband uh, down this road, this road, cut these two roads in and came down this road, we would pick up 121 households. It would be, you know, 14 miles as the crow flies. And here are the other services that are running through that area right now. Um, those are the type of plans that you can take to service providers, uh, like an Armstrong cable from Butler, like a velocity network out of Erie. Um, and you, you, um, you can go to them and say, hey, here are the plans that we have here. Are, this would, you know, hit 21% of, of the folks out in this municipality, um, you know, what does that look like from a pricing standpoint? And now they can help scope and they can come up with a price per mile for them. They can look to see what dollars are available and they can help come up with real plans. Um, I got some feedback from, some, from a, some of these service providers that said, you know, municipalities will come and say, well, what does it take to cover everyone? How do I get, you know, everyone? And that's very hard because the amount of time it takes to scope those plans, to figure out the total geographic mileage of, of the lines, to figure out how many households they'll connect, to figure out the ROI back for the services they charge to each house, um, that's, that's a, a much harder sell than very specific plans. Um, you can contact your, you know, talk to the municipal governments around uh, time estimates. You know, you know, if we're going to bring this in, are we looking at four years, five years, six years? And look for open ditch efforts. And an open ditch effort is simply, hey, we're running new phone, you know, new phone poles. Hey, we're going to have this open because we have to run sewage where we never had sewage before. Or these water lines need replaced. Um, you know, anywhere that a service um, or that a pole or a ditch is being disrupted is an excellent time to string additional infrastructure um, because you don't have the same costs and the same crews and road maintenance, uh, horizontal drilling, all of that good stuff that comes with it. Finally, look for funding sources, you know, contacting the county government and seeing what monies are available from the CARES Act, looking at the, uh, the broadband infrastructure plan, you know, that's, that's currently been passed uh, by the Pennsylvania St uh, State Senate, looking at, at what uh, the current administration, um, you know, is planning out from an infrastructure rollout. Be ready to seize those dollars. Be ready to see how they scope and be ready to see what you can use them for. Because once they become available, there's generally a finite time for them to be spent. And if you don't act quickly, you can run into issues. Um, again, I mentioned, you know, looking for county governments for the same type of things, um, you know, uh, funding and, and um, other projects that may be in scope. Uh, contact your state representatives. You know, there's no reason why that legislation that we're stuck with around Pennsylvania's definition of broadband um, it, it needs to stay in place. Additionally, that Pennsylvania Utility Code, we're one of 18 states that prohibit municipalities from starting and operating their own uh, broadband service, uh, service services. So to give you an idea of how this manifests itself, if, uh, if a provider comes in and say, says they meet that threshold of 1.54 slash 128, right? That really low mark that we're stuck with. If they say they can meet that, 
a municipality cannot start its own service provider because that area is already being serviced. Now, does that area want that service? Is that service adequate? Absolutely not. But because of these, you know, almost blue laws that we're stuck with here that could easily be repealed or changed, we lose out on opportunities to bring more competitors in the market and bring this service to more Pennsylvania residents. Um, and finally, um, the, the, the Pennsylvania school, uh, school system has an E-rate office. And for those of you who don't know, E-rate is federally funded dollars for communications. That brings and helps uh, subsidize um, broadband infrastructure for libraries and schools, um, uh, private or public uh, throughout the state. And we have an office um, that actually coordinates um, all of that funding. So when new laws are passed, when new funds are made available, um, you know, there is one coordinator that schools can contact and say, what monies are out there? What can I do? What's the best way to do this? Who around me is doing something that I can collaborate with? And we don't have that for broadband. Um, as an emerging piece of infrastructure, an office like that would be incredibly helpful to help scope and time projects and help these very specific municipal asks when a provider gets invested to see what's out there and what's available. Finally, vote. You know, support candidates that value broadband and recognize the digital divide as an issue. You know, there are pieces of legislature being passed at the Pennsylvania, um, at the state level, you know, uh, House Bill 2438 and Senate Bill 835 that does allocate some of this money and that does make stringing things on existing uh, infrastructure pieces easier to do. So there is effective legislature being done and you should support candidates if it means something to you to go out and do that. Uh, finally, you can contact, you know, your, your state or even your, 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 uh, your state representation at the federal level, you know, you can lobby for the FCC to be, you know, hold out longer timelines, uh, make e those E-rate dollars I mentioned before available for households. Um, I know there is a, a low uh, income household program coming out now through the FCC. Uh, if you simply Google that term, uh, low income household FCC reimbursement. There are monies available right now for a limited time to help subsidize internet. The FCC also published an app that you can download free of use, and you, it will go out and run a speed test on your network and feed that data back to the FCC. So you can go out and in rural areas like Wattsburg, feed back to the FCC that, you know, the service you're receiving from, um, let's say, Verizon, is not up to up to speed for what the FCC would consider a broadband definition. And finally, be patient. You know, funding takes time. You know, these monies have been talked about and talked about, and they're being released. You know, your service providers, your Velocities, your Armstrongs, you know, they have other projects in the pipe. It may be a bit for them to get to you, but they, ought, you know, trust me, they're willing to sell you a service. That, that's why they exist. And getting this, these monies, you know, at, in their hands to help them do that is a great next step. And finally, as I mentioned, the Starlink service, um, the low orbit satellite is probably a great stopgap measure and may even be a permanent measure for households that are just so far off the grid that none of this is feasible. Um, from what I understand, from what's being published, you know, no data caps, fixed costs. Um, there is a, a pretty hefty investment fee to, to start up, but, you know, service throughout the country, you know, it may be an option that folks should explore. And I, I implore you, tell your neighbors, tell your friends, you know, if they can't get anything better, it may be something worth exploring. I get no stake. I, I mean, I own no stock in the company. I get nothing for them from pitching that. You know, I, I do believe that traditional high-speed wired broadband is the way to go um, because, you know, again, it's satellite. Line of sight things can impact it. Weather can impact it. But in a last ditch, you know, last ditch effort, last case, you know, it's still there. It's still something. Um, so I, I appreciate you staying with me. Um, you know, I, I would open it up now for any questions. And, uh, and, and thank you, uh, thank you very much. Also a special thanks before I forget um, to the Wasburg Area School District the School Board and, and, and Dr. Berlin for helping me facilitate this. I, I hope it was, uh, I hope when this data kicks back to them and actually one last thing to touch on, you know, part of that prescriptive action I was going to take, this, uh, this paper that I'll be putting together is going to get shared with the board with the district and with all five municipalities in the Wasburg area school district uh, to kind of you know sit on and, and, and hopefully um, take some of these uh, prescriptive methods to heart. And with that, I'll turn it over back to Ben. Thanks, Ben. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thorough. There was a lot to go through. That was, uh, thank you. I, I, I can't stop saying that. And I say that as somebody who grew up in rural Pennsylvania as well, southwestern rural Pennsylvania. So I, I, I know a lot of the challenges. I know still the presence of uh, satellite internet in the discussions before of how rough that had been, but now how good that can be in the changing conversation. So this certainly is uh, not just an Erie County specific issue, but a statewide issue and really a nationwide issue. And I think one of the things that sometimes we as Americans might take for granted is we're not doing high speed internet all that well as a country. You know, we barely crack the top 10 when we look at other countries out there. We're being outpaced uh, the top two providers uh, globally, uh, you know, South Korea and Norway, uh, get internet much better to their people than we do. So certainly the nation as a whole has a long way to go to catch up. Uh, I think there are a lot of great options to look at there. And so I thank you for that prescriptive action of what you can do now, how you can navigate the conversation and continue to steer people in that right direction. I'm going to head to the comment section to take a look and see. Uh, folks, friendly reminder, if you've got questions for Jeff about the rural digital divide, uh, leave them in the comment section if you're watching live on this Facebook post. Uh, we're going to get to those. We're going to get to some comments as well. Uh, while I'm scouring that, can I kick back over my colleague, Dr. Andrew Roth, for a question, some follow-up up. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Roth, for all the work you do with the Ramey Fellows facilitating that program and, and really giving space for projects like this and discussions like this, where we have folks in the community looking at critical issues facing our region that do have that regional and state and national implications. Dr. Roth, over to you. Thanks, Ben. And, and thank you, Jeff. I, I really want to thank you and compliment you on a, just a, a first class uh, uh, piece of work. Uh, this is really valuable information uh, for the Wasburg School District, uh, for those municipalities, those five municipalities. And, and this is really the kind of work uh, I think that we had in, had, had in uh, mind that we would want the Ramey Fellows to do. Things that actually uh, can, immediate, can be immediately impactful in a community. Uh, not just an academic study. And as I looked at, as I was listening to you, um, you know, there's a couple of things that just jumped off uh, at me and, and it just really uh, supports, you know, the importance of this. Uh, I forget how you arrived at it, but you were talking about in terms of access, uh, something like 50% of the households in the Wasburg area school district do not have access or reliable, consistent access to widespread, to high speed broadband. Um, uh, and that's critical because the homework gap is really is really a major issue. Uh, as you pointed out, there are households within the district that have access to this. Uh, I'm in a, I've been in education my whole life. In some ways, I'm somebody who went away to college and never left. Uh, I've spent a whole a whole career in education, and I, I understand uh, you know the need in the absence of hard data to make generalizations. But I would hypothesize that in general, uh, the households who have it, the students would have performed better over the course of the pandemic than the students who didn't have it. I mean, I, now we get into uh, uh, you know, social scientists always want to run a t-test and find out a p-score and say, you know, statistical significance. I'm not going to quibble about all of that, but I'm just making the general observation so that it's, it's really and, and you demonstrated it with that data about access, it's really a social equity issue. Uh, and I think it's critical to the community uh, to get behind, as you, and you outlined a, a program of uh, steps that could be taken, uh, but really getting our state uh, legislative delegation and even uh, at the federal level, uh, getting uh, the, uh, the, the our congressional representatives aware of this. This is. Uh, this is, this is really critical as we now move, well, we're almost, a, it's hard enough for me to believe this, we're almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century. Uh, and so this is not an option. This is, uh, this is something that's absolutely necessary uh, for those young people in that school district uh, and actually all the others to, um, you know, to thrive and to have the opportunity to thrive. And I was thinking about it when you were talking about the speeds and then I'll go over to see if Ben has questions from the audience. Uh, today's viewers, yeah. For those of us who aren't directly impacted in education, and you're trying to figure out, well, what's all of this about download and upload speed? You know, if you're trying to watch, uh, if you're trying to uh, stream a movie on Prime Video or whatever or Netflix, and then suddenly you get the little thing in the middle of your screen rotating, that thing is buffering because it can't keep up. 
That, that's literally what it means, it's speed. So that's one thing to frustrate you if you're trying to watch a movie. If it's a student trying to learn and he's consistently, constantly getting timed out, well, that, that, that frustration will then ultimately lead to throw up their hands and walk away. So this is not just some abstract theoretical thing. Ben, I see you nodding your head. Maybe we have some questions. So I thank you, Dr. Roth, and I'll start with a comment first uh, from this person. This is very nice presentation of valuable information. Thank you very much for your fine work. Uh, so I certainly echo that. I know others are in the comments section. Yes, thanks. Um, it, it, one of the questions is, uh, assuming that Pennsylvania is, is not alone uh, in setting its own uh, non-FCC metrics of what it means to have broadband internet, um, th wouldn't this not, though, put states at a disadvantage when competing for now the remote workforce? And I think this person's thinking about, uh, we're certainly going to see a shift to remote work. Uh, and and you know, some, some tech giants have already pledged, nobody has to come back to the office. It's remote from now on. So uh, we're going to see folks leaving Silicon Valley, see folks leaving uh, the Bay Area to perhaps live and enjoy all four seasons in Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, but they want to need, they need to be where internet is. Wouldn't this put states at a disadvantage by artificially keeping that threshold low and not supplying quicker internet? Wouldn't it be to Pennsylvania's advantage to bump that number up, attract more jobs and create a re remote workforce? Oh, absolutely. There's a, a really great effort going on uh, from Penn State University that actually goes and documents the, uh, the living footprint of, of speed access throughout the, uh, throughout the, the state. I don't have that URL uh, off the top of my head, but as, as I said, they, they've, they've kind of, um, they've kind of shown that. And, and not only are they, they, it's, it's misleading in the sense that again, that meets Pennsylvania's definition uh, of, of broadband, but we need to do better as a state, not only for, like you said, remote work options um, and, and our students, uh, you know, that are there for, for online learning, but just as an, as an accessible, you know, access to services that everyone else is consuming. You know, we, you know, Pennsylvania is, uh, is gorgeous. I've been a, a resident of Northwest Pennsylvania, um, you know, my, my whole life, I, I love it here. But, you know, as you start to get out and you start to find people who want to come here and we want to attract those good paying jobs that maybe work elsewhere, but, you know, can, can you utilize our school districts and, and, and contribute to our local tax revenues? You know, that is very important. And again, some of these archaic laws that are on the books are skewing that data and providing, you know, the wrong sort of message to send in. You know, Erie actually has, has been identified as a great place to remote work. You know, we're two hours away from three major cities. We're, you know, less than five hours from Toronto and from New York City. Um, you know, there's recreation uh, abound. Uh, you know, things are plentiful and cheap. Have you ever gone out on a Saturday night? It costs you nothing, right? Um, you know, it's a great place to live. And, and we are missing out on some of those opportunities, uh, we, you know, if we're not talking about directly in a footprint that's served by one of these high-speed broadband providers. And, and, and I can't help but... That's an excellent point. And I, I can't help but add, you know, I, I think that we're going to continue to see states, uh, you know, grapple with the attraction and, and thinking of economic development differently, jobs differently. Um, you know, and Pennsylvania is an older state with an, you know, an older population and, and thinking about attracting younger workforce and talent into the area that perhaps might not have a job here, but is still working here and then still paying tax dollars in the state uh, and still residing here. And, and absolutely, like, like you said, Jeff, the any number of great things to take advantage of in Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see that. I, I, I have a question for you too, Jeff. What, what surprised you the most when you got into this research? What shocked you when you came across something and you said, this just can't be, and so you had to fact check it and you found another source that actually supported it. And you said, this is really alarming to me when you were starting to unpack all of this. You know, it's, it's funny, having lived uh, in, in the current place that we do, we, we spent nine years without high-speed broadband. We relied on cellular hotspots and um, while mostly effective, you know, certainly faced our challenges. Um, I, you know, I, I am an IT professional, so overcoming some of those technical obstacles, not overly challenging for me, but I can tell you when I wasn't home, uh, my, my wife would scream my, you know, scream my name because she was so upset that, you know, why isn't this working today? So I, I should have suspected that, that this gap would be bigger 
uh, or, or as big as it presents itself in Wattsburg. And again, we, we have the, the luxury of having two municipalities that have uh, you know, high-speed fiber run through it for, you know, for other, uh, other smaller uh, districts in, in, the, uh, in the county. That may not necessarily be the case. So you know, I, I, I think that jumped out to me just when we got to you know, only, only uh, 50% of, of Wattsburg residents in, um, in, or in the footprint of Wattsburg Area School District in 2021 had access to you know, high-speed fiber. Um, that was shocking. The reliability metrics, I would have guessed, but when you see them on paper, I think they're very glaring, right? When you look at what cellular and what satellite and what DSL and how difficult that can be to maintain steady uh, productive environments, I think that jumped out at me. Um, you know, certainly the price per mile because I'm not in the industry. Uh, you know, that jumped out. Uh, you know, and again, that survey or that that number was was uh, was uh, was older. Uh, and the, actually, the last data point that I didn't have in the slideshow that I thought was really interesting. Uh, the last question on the survey that was asked um, said something around. You know, this 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 survey was centered around Wattsburg Area School District and K through 12 students, right? You know, if 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 high speed broadband were to be run throughout all of these municipalities, do you think it would benefit the community? And 86% of respondents said, absolutely, yes, it would. 4% um, said no. So they, I, you know, I'm surprised, but, you know, maybe that's the exact same 4% that don't have internet now and don't want to be bothered. And, you know, there is something said to be, you know, leading a very, very off the grid kind of life. I totally empathize. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think it's very much recognized that local businesses being able to take advantage of it, you know, dairy farms and auction houses and, you know, all, uh, you know, um, uh, ironworking shops and, and, and mills. I think those are the types of things that without, you know, if they're still trying to rely on dial-up, they don't have an online presence and may, they're, they're not picking up the business they necessarily could be. You know, everyone in the area knows them. Everyone who's right down the road knows them, but they could, they could be advertising and seeing new streams of business. Um, I think one of the surprising things about the pandemic and something that our our Civic Leadership Society um, project uncovered was how multiple businesses had to, to, to kind of transition and morph to new, new ways of service, right? I can no longer have you in my front door. I can no longer see you without a mask. What can I do to st still keep moving product and product that you want? And you know, I think being able to have that online presence is a huge deal. So I would definitely echo more on the 86% um, who said, yes, that this would benefit not only K to 12 households, but really all forms of, of um, you know, of, of kind of households and businesses, you know, throughout that, throughout that footprint. I, I can't help but think that, uh, you know, you, you, even using the terms di digital literacy, and then I think of the digitally illiterate, those who, you know, just don't have that capacity. And I, I think, you know, as, as an English major, you know, I can't help but think of the word illiterate. And, and so I think there's always going to be that, you know, th those who choose not to read, those who, you know, not not that they have, they lack the ability, but those who willingly choose not to. And so there always will, I, I, I assume, be those that want to be off the grid and totally disconnected. But I think seeing the overwhelming, uh, you know, positive affirmation that this would help our communities to get this, because I think of, you know, the connection to the internet every time a credit card transaction happens at a place of business. If your internet goes out, you're cash only. And we know that as a society, we are tending to move away from carrying cash and relying on, you know, a transaction that needs the internet. And then Jeff, you, you pointed out a great example too of moving entire businesses online to have storefronts, to be able to, to transact with somebody who doesn't have to leave their house, but still wants to order your product and then does that over the internet that that happens. Um, and Andy, I want to give you a chance. Any last questions as we're almost out of time here for you? Any, any last thoughts, um, things that you'd like to add before uh, we wrap up? And of course, Jeff, we are certainly looking for, well, that, looking for uh, that paper and, and publishing that and being able to read that and share that with, with our audience. Uh, Dr. Roth, over to you. Uh, I, again, I just really want to thank Jeff for the really high quality job he did. And to uh, reiterate what you just said, this will ultimately be published as a Jefferson essay with some of the other uh, projects the other Ramey fellows are doing. And a lot of the valuable information will be in the, the uh, appendices to Jeff. So, I mean, he didn't uh, bury you in statistics, but the data behind the, the findings. But I think really what you've done, Jeff, is show that the, digi the rural digital divide exists. And I think one of the things the pandemic did is focus people's attention on it. And obviously a lot of people, because of uh, the educational 
uh, component and wanting to do what's best uh, for our, for the ch for families and their children in our area went to the, the educational thing. But I think it's really important to pick up on what you said later. This is also economic development. Uh, and one of the things, uh, you know, none of us know the answer to this question that as the pandemic ends or begin or we learn to live with it because we can't stay sheltered in place forever but nonetheless we're never going to go back to doing everything exactly the way we did it before and just as we right here the three of us um, ben is not even in the in the area at the moment you're in wattsburg i'm over in uh, on the corner of where mccain fairview and uh, mill creek all come together and yet here we are all on this square this is the way the world now works and communities have to become part of this or really risk getting left behind. So there's both the, uh, the educational, uh, which is of course what, where my bias is first because of my background, the, the educational urgency for this that 50% uh, of the households, the children are at a disadvantage at the get go uh, in this world, but also the economic potential uh, for the region. Uh, and I say that for the region as a whole, because I saw that same report that you mentioned, Jeff, that P that Erie has a high, okay, it snows in February. Get over it, folks. We all know how to deal with the snow. Uh, that Erie has an incredibly high quality of life and that actually it's been e being identified as a place where people who no longer are place bound can come and live a high quality of life at a reasonable uh, expense rate. But in order to do that, you need this. And I'm pointing at my computer here, but you okay. need this because this is this is the world we live in. So thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, yeah, and one last uh, note to close. Um, you know, I, I do think that as a lot of municipal governments and even state governments have moved to online, you know, forums, school boards, uh, you, you know, the, the, they've made themselves um, available. I don't think that's going to change post pandemic. I think that request for that online presence at a meeting not only encourages and drives up participation, but also membership as well. And and I think that that was, that is something that these you know these folks, um, the the four percent who said no, you know, even if you don't need it for school, right? Even if you don't want it for your business, um, being able to, to attend some of these things virtually and, and, you know, every now and then get on Go Erie or Amazon or any of those things, you know, that is a quality of life factor. And I think that's, that's very important. So, yep, I could not agree more. It, Jeff, you nailed it. I, I, uh, just recent reports are showing now more than ever, there has been a higher degree of transparency in civic life, being able to broadcast council meetings, borough meetings, uh, any sort of meeting that's happening at a city hall or a town borough office. Uh, now people can tune in via YouTube. They can tune in via Facebook. They can tune in wherever. Why lower? Once that access, that barrier to access has been lowered and people have been let in, why raise it again afterwards? But now take the opportunity to make sure that as we're lowering that barrier, everyone can get over it. And that means they need that access and they can connect where they are if they have that desire. Let's get it there. Uh, Jeff, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for all that you've done. I can't wait to see the paper. Can't wait to read that and share that with our audience. We are grateful for you, uh, Dr. Andrew Roth, scholar in residence uh, at the JES and, and host of uh, American Tapestry uh, Project on WQLN Public Media with episodes available on the NPR One app. And of course, why we're here today, facilitator of the Ramey Fellowship Program with Ramey Fellow Jeff Staborski, a tech industry professional and graduate himself of an Erie Region Rural School District, taking a look at just that, the rural digital divide and helping us to understand that, get to know it better and what we can do, a prescriptive uh, steps of action to address that in our own backyard in Erie County. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your insights and knowledge with us. We are greatly appreciative of that. Looking forward to that paper, which will be available at jesery.org. Folks will put out word uh, when that is available. And of course, folks to all of you thank you for tuning in uh just as the three of us couldn't be here on screen having this program it wouldn't happen without you tuning in watching on your screen uh, all the programming that we've been able to host uh throughout the pandemic and continuing onward being able to connect digitally here so thank you thank you thank you folks for tuning in and of course for more information about upcoming jes digital programming do visit our website jesery.org you're also going to find uh videos of past presentations all available to stream on demand other publications uh, also available there including uh 
of the past Ramey Fellow essays and reports, all available jesgeary.org, as well as Dr. Roth's book note series. You can find that there. And of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.